five minute with Eric. So we just did a one minute where we talked about what happens if you sign a personal guarantee. So here's the fact pattern. You have a business, it's a retail business, you're in a shopping mall and you sign a personal guarantee when you sign the lease. And this personal guarantee that I just saw was a one page, one big paragraph at the end. So it's at the very end of the lease. And so I asked the people, did you use a lawyer to negotiate this? And they said, no, they didn't. And I asked them, do you know about this personal guarantee? And they're like, well, kind of, but we're not really sure. And now here's the point that I'm involved in the story. Okay, so follow me. COVID happens, they shut the business down, they close the LLC that they had the business under, they move out of the spot, um, they have some oral negotiations with the first landlord, they get nothing in writing, they thought they had a deal, but they're not sure. New landlord buys the entire property, new landlord's not bound by some oral agreement. Now, real quick, you can't have an oral agreement for land, for leases. Um, it's called the statute of frauds. It's basically a rule that they invented hundreds of years ago where they said some things are too important to leave to he said, she said. Some things have to be in writing. And so it must be a contract. Now, pause for a second. They didn't use a lawyer when they negotiated the lease, so they didn't really know what they were doing. And the lease, many commercial leases are very negotiable, meaning that the landlord maybe would have been open to making changes. So we ended up with this very one-sided lease. It had a personal guarantee. Then they're deciding to close the business and break the lease. Again, did they get a lawyer? No, they didn't. They're doing it themselves. They're negotiating with the landlord themselves. Um, they get something orally, but no one even told them that that's unenforceable. So then landlord number two buys the property and says, hey, wait a minute, you guys are in default. I'm not honoring any oral agreement you made with anybody else. And so now I'm going to sue you. Now I'm gonna sue your LLC and I'm gonna sue you personally, jointly and severally, that's what it's called, because you signed a personal guarantee. You gave them permission to do that. Now, do they get a lawyer at this point? They don't. So now the, 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 the lawsuit is pursued and these things can take months. Sometimes they're faster, sometimes they're slower, sometimes it'll depend on how aggressively the plaintiff is pushing it, um, which sometimes will have a f uh, factor of you know how how much pressure is their client putting on them? How much is their client paying them to move this case forward? How many cases do they have? What's the volume of the court cases in that jurisdiction, right? At every different county, because you're gonna be county by county. So uh, the time it takes for a Broward County might be different than an Orange County or a Miami or a Lee or a Brevard. And these are all Florida counties, by the way, and I'm sure it's the same everywhere else. And so anyways, at this point, they finally get a lawyer. And the lawyer says, hey, I think I can make a deal. Now, here's the thing. The total amount outstanding under this lease, not including the 18%, which is the maximum allowed interest in Florida, which is what we call the usury law. But basically the contract said, in the event of a default, the tenant will owe us the full amount of rent that was owed under the lease. So let's say there's two years left on the lease. So they owe the two years of rent, plus from the day of the breach, 18% interest, which is 1.5% a month month on month on month, plus court keys, court costs and attorney's fees. Sorry about that. And so what ends up happening is they enter into a settlement agreement, okay? And the settlement agreement says, let's put this case to bed. We're gonna file the settlement agreement with the court and we'll agree to pay $35,000 and here's our payment plan. And don't worry, we're gonna get on this payment plan. Um, now, at this point, they, they're like, we had no confidence in our lawyer. He didn't explain to us anything. He didn't explain to us what would happen if we defaulted. And so sure enough, the, the settlement agreement says, if the payment is not made by 5 p.m. at the lawyer's office on the day that it is due, then it's immediate default. And what happens, immediate default, they get to go to court the next day, file an ex parte motion, meaning that they don't even need to give you notice, and then they can get the full amount. So even though they settled for 35K, now all of a sudden he owes something like 80K plus 30K in attorney's fees, I'm sorry, plus 30K in interest, plus 20K in attorney's fees, plus court costs, which is usually, you know, call it 500 bucks. And when you add it all up, you ended up with a number crazy, like $140,000 that this 26 year old kid, and now he's asking, do I file for bankruptcy? So there's a lot of different things to pull out of this story. Um, one thing that I wanna say is when you sign a settlement agreement and it has a stipulation and it has an automatic default judgment clause in there, they don't have to play nice. If you're late on the payment, they can 
call you in default, and now all of a sudden they can chase you for 20 years, they can go after your bank accounts, mom had co-signed bank accounts with her sons, guess what, they're gonna take mom's money now because it's, it's all in one bank account. So guys, if you have questions about leases, if you have issues with default judgments or with settlement agreements, please leave a comment below. I'm happy to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one.